thank you so much for having me. I'm a frequent visitor to U of M pre-pandemic, so it's good to be back here since the pandemic has kind of somewhat cleared. Uh, and I do just want to start off by saying everything I'm about to say is my own opinion. I'm not representing the federal government. I'm not representing George Mason. I'm not representing the University of Michigan. I'm here um, representing my own opinions, just in case anybody's uh, worried. Um, okay, so, oh, good. Yes, the Pandora's box of autonomous vehicles. I'm gonna talk about that, but I wanna give you a little back, bit of background so that you understand where I'm coming from. So you heard Henry say that I was a former fighter pilot and I did fly the A4 Echo and the FNA C and D F-18. All, those two aircraft mean I'm kind of old, um, but they also mean, if you can see inside this cockpit, that's, that's, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm the worst driver. Uh, I, I, you know, I have to tell you, the uh, spending a year at NHTSA made me a much better driver. I'm actually taking the bus a lot more uh, because uh, people are not wearing their seatbelts. I mean, it's crazy to know how many people are not wearing their seatbelts out there. Uh, so, yeah. Single person, single seat means I think I can do everything myself. It's a problem. It's why I'm still single. <laughs> okay. Now, so I translated that experience into becoming a professor. That's a whole nother discussion I can have some other time. But I spent the bulk of my initial years as an academic working on autonomous aviation systems. Not surprising, you know, I'm an aviator. Uh, I was one of the first people to kind of get what was happening with unmanned aerial vehicles, drones. You know, if you want to see some funny uh, videos on YouTube, you can see me with John Stewart on The Daily Show um, because, you know, uh, and he's trying to go go for me. And, um, you know, I was trying to on that show, I was trying to explain to people how drones were coming. And indeed, that came true. So at that time, though, right after I was on The Daily Show, Jeff Bezos made an announcement that he was going to basically commercialize Prime Air. And, uh, you know, when you're a professor who's doing research and your research is commercialized, it is no longer research, right? So I knew I had to get a new field to really sink my teeth into. And so at the time I was working with the DARPA Urban Grand Challenge people at MIT. And then, so that kind of, I just jumped into the self-driving car world because I knew that that was gonna be a big upcoming thing. Um, so, and indeed it did. And so I've done a ton of research looking at the autonomy in the cars, humans in the car. This is a, a very funny, fun, hard study that we ran while I was at Duke that looked at boredom. So we had people sitting in a simulator for four hours and then they drove for four hours. It's very boring in a simulator. They didn't drive, you know, the, the system was on its ACC system. And then we watched what people would do. We'd let them bring their cell phones in there if they would normally bring them into their car. And this, uh, about two and a half hours into it, a moose walked across the road. It ambled, it did not dart. Uh, and uh, I think out of 30 something uh, subjects, all but one hit it. And this is him, his reaction. You can see, and I love, cause he brings up the cell phone cause he was holding it low, you know, he's the low texter. So he brings it up and then, and you can see his reaction. And so this was, uh, funded actually by Google, this study, what, before it became Waymo. So indeed, I, of many researchers, a group of researchers helped Waymo come to the conclusion that L3 was probably not a good idea. And I know that may be controversial in this room, and I'm sorry if I'm stepping on anyone's toes, but uh, it is a problem, and we're going to come back to that. And so uh, this plus all the other research I've been doing over the years has made me very wary of putting humans in cars with a lot of automation. I, we don't have time here for me to go to in, in the planes, but that's also true in planes. So then eventually I ended up starting to test Teslas because number one, they were the only, the most advanced car that I could test on a dedicated test track in North Carolina. We wanted to originally test Teslas and GM Super Cruise, but Super Cruise only works in mapped areas as well as much everybody in the room knows. So that just left us to testing Teslas. I was not trying to go after Tesla. I was not trying to ruin anybody's um, stock investment. 
we really just wanted to know how variable the autonomy in the Tesla was so that if you are a distracted driver, so the assumption was that you were, just how bad would the variability in the car be and how could that lead you to have lots of problems? So this is a table that just shows you, we did three different tests on highway, lane departure, construction zone, and we were looking for consistency. So CW means consistency within, I means inconsistent, consistent CA means consistent with all. So we really just trying to look for consistencies and some unsafe behaviors. And you can see there's all kinds of unsafe behaviors in the construction zone. One Tesla would have killed you in every single test, um, uh, but the other was, others were good, right? So this is what we were just trying to get to. So, oh boy, oh boy. People did not like the study. People mostly who had Teslas and certainly people who invested in Teslas. And I made the mistake of being a woman in this field. Uh, so there's a lot of misogyny out there. That's a whole nother discussion. So then I it was announced that I was going, I was graciously invited to join NHTSA, uh, which I left at the chance because I had been complaining about NHTSA for years. And I'm one of these people who feels like if you, you shouldn't complain about something if you're not willing to go in and fix it. So I went to NHTSA and I hadn't really even gotten there yet when Twitter found out and they went crazy. Um, I like to point out, I took this at the, I had the presence of mind while uh, my whole world was going up in flames to take this, I, I was trending, NHTSA controversy with trending, 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 trending on, it's probably the only time that's going to happen because I no longer have a Twitter account, but then that led to this, you're laughing, no. and this was serious, this was someone willing to threaten to kill me and my family because of that table that I just showed you, that all it showed you was the consistency of three cars in various test track scenarios. And, you know, I'm, I know that this room today being in Michigan, I mean, this is very near and dear to your hearts. You know, this is something that's, that's, you know, people are killing other people needlessly in your backyard. And this is what I have to contend with. And it's amazing that I had to have a security discussion with George Mason, because we're concerned about what is my talk today, which is open to the public, who is that going to incite, and what is that going to do in my life? And it's just amazing that I find myself here telling you what I have been saying all along in my autonomy research, uh, but that's the world we live in. And some of you might be asking, why are you doing this? Like, is it really that important? Is it really that important to get out there and start poking the bear and making everyone on the planet, trust me, everyone hates me today. All manufacturers, NHTSA, uh, my 15 year old daughter, everyone hates me, okay. Uh, I'm good with that. I don't mind being the bad cop because I do think that we're at the most important time in history since we figured out brake lights and headlights I think that we are in the scariest time in transportation with autonomy and technology. I think we're making some big mistakes. And I'm coming here to give this talk, really not to be paternalistic and not to nag, except to tell you, look, I have been a researcher for many years. I spent a year with, graciously spent a year with NHTSA. There's some things that I've seen and some bigger thoughts I've been having, and I've actually changed my opinion, having uh, worked with the government now, and now I'm sharing with you what I, Missy Cummings, think, and maybe giving you some tips about how to think about the world. Um, and I'm gonna do that through a framework that I put together many years ago, actually in aviation. I put together this skill, rule, knowledge, and expert-based behavior framework when I was in the aviation world to help people think about how do we balance the human and the machine? You know, when should the computer be taking control and when should the human be taking control? And so any agent, autonomous agent, whether we're talking about a human or a autonomous computer agent has to go through these four stages of reasoning when they're working in a non-deterministic world, which is the world we live in. So you go through skill-based reasoning and, in terms of driving, what that means is, look, when you first learn how to drive, and I'm doing this right now with my 15 and a half year old, oh my God, it is so scary. I really wish driverless cars were on the road today because I am not being a very good teacher to my daughter. Uh, 
she had to learn to stay between the lines of the road and it's ping pong, right? And uh, I get a little motion sickness. I've never done that before because, you know, she's trying to learn to stay between the lines. But, you know, after a couple of times of driving, she's got it, right? But her sensors had to learn to acclimate to that information. And once she got it, she went on automatic. Now she has time to think about the stop sign. So I see that uh, octagon. And what do I do when I see that octagon? So I have to go through a set of rules in my head, which is exactly what autonomous vehicles do as well. Okay, now she's got, she's learning the rules. We're not quite there yet. She doesn't have her learner's permit yet because uh, they only get three chances to pass in Virginia. So she's taking it seriously. So once she has figured that out, it frees up more cognitive resources to start doing judgment under uncertainty, which is knowledge-based reasoning. And in this case here, I show a partially obscured stop sign. It's in England. That's why it's facing that way. Uh, but you, you know what that is. Any human who's driving or even with their learner's permit knows that a partially obscured stop sign with branches over it is a stop sign. You don't have to see the whole sign. Turns out this has been a problem. And if you can't perceive the sign correctly, then it's hard for you to know to measure where you are in the world, right? So we're able to, there's some uncertainty in the world with bushes, we can do it. And we'll talk a little bit later about how this seems to be a, a, a tripping point for autonomy. Last but not least, expert-based reasoning. So this intersection with all these crazy signs is actually was a place somewhere in America. If you haven't seen it, you haven't been driving in rural America enough. I'm sure there's plenty of places in Michigan that look just like this. And uh, somehow you got yourself in a really bad situation. And uh, I've been there because I have a Jeep and I think, let's go back to the single seat fighter pilot. There, I think that there's nowhere I can't go in my Jeep. Okay, so you find yourself in a bad situation, you got to get yourself out, you're going to have to break a rule. So that's what expert based reasoning is right there, you're in an exceptional circumstance, you don't have any rules, you've never actually really even done this before, and you kind of have to think out of the box to figure out how to do it. And so now we'll talk about well, what does what do all these things mean in the world of autonomous vehicles. So I really appreciate I've worked with I know there was somebody from Toyota here earlier. Oh, good toy. So Toyota Research Institute worked with them on this. Um, they were very gracious in um, letting me use these pictures. So this is TRI with MIT in Cambridge. And um, this picture is probably about eight years old. So eight years old, okay. They get, the car will not go. The car has struggles. They eventually, a human has to take over. They go back to the lab and they have to pull the tapes and they have to figure out what happened. What, why did the car freak out in this place? That is because you as a human saw one moving truck. That's it. That's what your brain said. And you didn't think any more about it. The underlying computer vision system saw a gigantic person that was about to attack. Uh, two trucks, a bus, a traffic sign, a fence, four poles and a bunch of other things around. Now, this is a problem with labeling and the ability for, for autonomy to see the world as a whole integrated system, as opposed to it being bottom-up pixel driven. This is an eight-year-old picture. This is still very much a problem we're having today, a la Tesla in the Bay Bridge Tunnel. Now look, this is an eight car pilot, phantom braking, we know it's a problem. This, I mean, you can just go on the NHTSA website and see all kinds of complaints. This is not big news, but it is important news. And for all you Tesla fanboys out there who are jumping on Twitter right now, so you can attack me, I'm here to tell you, it's not just a Tesla problem. All manufacturers who deal in autonomy are dealing with this problem. It is not just a Tesla ADAS problem. It is an ADAS problem in general. It is a self-driving car problem in general. How to make sure that this is not seen is actually extremely difficult. And you know nobody really knows yet uh, why this happened. If you go actually read my Tesla testing, Missy Cummings, having tested a bunch of Teslas, probably a shadow, probably a shadow that we didn't really appreciate the configuration of how the shadows fell, fell um, on the road. Who knows, I could be wrong, but something's wrong. And if you can't get past skill-based reasoning, you got a serious problem, right? Because you can't ever get to those other levels if you can't get past the cars being able to skillfully navigate the world. All right, 
Now, let me now move to Cruz, who's now going to be mad at me. This was a very well publicized accident in California. Indeed, I've left the link here so you can go get the two links where I got this information and got this picture from. So uh, the, crew, the cruise vehicle was taking a left. It kind of shot. There was a gap between two cars, kind of shot the gap, but there was another car coming um, in its unprotected left. It wasn't in the right lane. It was in a taxi lane only. Um, and uh, or and or right turn lane only. And the vehicle shot the gap and then slammed on its brakes kind of right in the middle of the intersection. So we could talk a lot about there were probably some skill based, some vision problems going on there, uh, but also that there's some rule based reasoning like. That car was speeding that was coming at them um, such that the physics just would not have led to it being able to turn like you just can't make a hard right turn like that going 40 miles an hour right so there were some basic physics principles that probably should have been fed into their model which weren't and indeed this is what this the, the uh, this author of this website agrees with me on this so you know it was probably an a bad choice although cruz has a different view on this so i've put their view up on that um you know, there's a lot of uncertainty. This is, you know, rule-based. Uh, we, we could even argue this might have fleeted up to the knowledge base. This probably sits somewhere between rule and knowledge base. There's some uncertainty about what's happening, but also I think my, the Missy Cummings opinion is because that car was in that right turn lane only and or the bus lane, you know, that maybe there was a rule triggered there that that car was gonna turn because it was in the right turn lane only. I don't know, I'm just guessing. But I think we have to understand that, you know, humans break the rules all the time, maybe illegally, maybe they shouldn't, but they do, right? Okay, let's talk about knowledge-based reasoning. Oh boy, San Francisco is about to, they're at their wits end with crews, right? Uh, I wish I could have been there to see this because this must have been amazing, um, uh, where a cruise vehicle started to go into an active firefighting scene and the firefighter broke the window out, presumably to be able to talk to the remote operator um, to get the car to get out of there. I just don't even know like how, you know, I mean, what, what chaos that must have been. Um, and so I think that this is, you know, this is when we talk about knowledge-based reasoning, I mean, there was a lot of uncertainty. The car got itself in a situation um, and the, the car couldn't figure it out, right? So the car failed at its knowledge-based reasoning, but then this also was a problem, expert-based reasoning. I think this is another problem that, that Cruise has now, and it's going to be a problem that all manufacturers have in the future, is remote operations, right? How do we effectively set up remote operations to be able to attend to this? Self-driving cars are going to get stuck. They are going to get confused. And how do we set up a remote op center that can respond rapidly, quickly, correctly? How do you know when you should notify a human in the remote op center to, to take over? I still think that these are completely new ideas to most companies. Uh, you know, it's a little bit of air traffic control for self-driving cars. Uh, and Cruz, if you're listening, I'm not picking on you. It's the same for Tesla. Cruise and Tesla are the furthest companies ahead. They're the furthest companies out there putting more cars on the road with these advanced forms of automation. By that strict, you know, frequency nature, they are probably going to be the ones that have the most trouble. So, uh, so let's talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now that you've seen me walk you through that framework. Okay, the good. Even though I just complained a lot about Cruz, I am in awe of Cruz and of Waymo and of all the other car companies uh, out there who have not had any major crashes. They haven't killed anybody since the Uber issue. So I, I am very 
you know, amazed uh, as a person who works in this world and sees problems every day. I think the self-driving community has done a very good job of policing themselves. I think once the Uber um, accident happened, the death of Elaine Hertzberg, I think they all got serious and said, oh yeah, we need to, as a community, come together. So for the most part, I think that they've done a pretty good job. I think that, you know, the rising uncertainty in a world is a very, very tough problem. And you're gonna have to up your game in terms of remote operations to help solve that. They're new at that. So I think that we that will get better over time. So for the most part, yeah, pretty good. The bad, oh, by the way, just the good, the bad, the ugly reference just shows you how old I am because there are a lot of young people out there going, what is she talking about? Come on, Clint Eastwood, he's one of my favorites. Okay. Bad. Here's some bad things that, you know, as a researcher and also having been at NHTSA for a while, here's some bad problems that I see. Uh, I, I'm not, I used to not have a problem with hands free, really. I, I, I never complained about hands free. But after working at NHTSA and reading every SGO, the Standing General Order Report, for more than a year, Boy, I have to tell you, there's a little post-traumatic stress that comes out of there. I am literally taking the bus a lot more in my life now after reading nothing but crashes um, over and over and over again. One of the things that I can see in the SGO and some of the narratives that aren't made, some of them you can see and some of them you can't see, there is um, in ADAS cars, not just Teslas, you can see in a narrative when a human was putting autopilot or super cruise or blue cruise or Honda pilot or fill in the blank. They put it on whatever version of autopilot they have, and then they relax. They relax because indeed that's what they've been told the technology is helpful to them. They, I'm just going to relax here and I'm going I'm to pay attention. And they think they might be paying attention for the most part, but you know, I need to get my, uh, stretch my legs. I might put my leg up over here. I might tuck my legs under the seat. You know, I've got to put my legs somewhere because it's a long journey and I'm going to put my legs and I'm going to put my arms in some comfortable position. And oh gosh, you know, uh, if I'm good and I'm not actually been on my cell phone, I recognize it. Oh, maybe I have a sweater right behind the back and I'm just going to reach around and grab something in the back. And then something bad happens and the autonomy can no longer address the situation. Now you've got a human whose feet are in the wrong place, hands are in the wrong place, and they've got to jump in and take over. And so there's a lot of over-controlling happening. And this is of no surprise to anyone, right? If you're shocked and something happens and there's a car stopped on the interstate in front of you, your reaction for most people who are not trained professional drivers is to over-control it. But there's something else going on too. People are getting their foot and going for the brake, and guess what they're doing? They're missing, and they're hitting the accelerator. And, and I, we've never had this issue before because for the most part, humans were staying in the same general physical area. So, and this is a missing Cummings hypothesis. I think what's happening is when we're telling people hands-free, they are going hands-free, they are going feet-free, and then when something happens and they have maybe a second or less, maybe even two seconds or less, they've got to jump back in and make the right decision and they can't do it or can't do it safely. So can people drive hands-free safely? Yes. But are we seeing problems when people have to interact very quickly? Yes. Yes. And I think we as a research community, I, I think we need to do more uh, on that. Um, and indeed, the phantom braking is another problem. We cannot, as humans, react as fast as cars can. Cars can get on the brakes so much faster than humans that our attention span often, in a lot of cases, first of all, it, and if it's happening in a weird situation, like in the Bay Bridge Tunnel, like your brain, there were people who were probably paying attention and then they saw the, the um, Tesla come to a hard braking and their brain just couldn't compute it fast enough. Like what? Like it's confusing, right? You don't normally see somebody slamming on their brakes in the middle of the Bay Bridge Tunnel. So people forget that there's a cognitive computation cost 
for humans to have to jump back into a situation. And all of this is to say, we're not doing a good job. I think, uh, I think we, we academics, industry are doing a bad job putting people in scenarios where they're set up for failure. Now, these two graphs below, um, another problem I think that's bad is that it's clear people are speeding in their ADAS systems. So let me give you all the disclaimers first. This data I'm showing you is old. It's out of date. It's not correct today, but I'm showing you this data because I'm trying to give you a tip about how to think about NHTSA's standing general order data. So in the standing general order, you get all this information about autonomous crashes. I think NHTSA was grossly unfairly taken to task uh, when the first standing general order data, came, data set came out. You know, people were, were just over the moon about, or not over the moon, they were um, very pointedly blaming Tesla for not being able to answer, uh, uh, NHTSA for not being able to answer the question, who's a better driver, humans versus autonomy? Look, we're not gonna answer that question. We're never gonna be able to answer that question. To actually know the answer unequivocally to that question, all automotive manufacturers would have to give us all the crash data, plus all the miles driven, plus all the miles driven under certain levels of autonomy, plus, 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 plus. First of all, a lot of companies don't have this data. Even Tesla doesn't, you know, who has amazing telematics data does not have this data, right? So we just aren't gonna get to that answer. So please don't blame NHTSA for not being able to tell you who's better humans or autonomy with the standing journal order data. That's not what it was meant for. It was meant to help NHTSA start to learn some of the lessons that I'm telling you about today, right? But there is one thing that you can do with this data. It is a crash data set. So it's a data set of got counts of crashes. And one of the things that you can see inside there is who's speeding and who's not speeding. And when they, were, when they had an accident, were they speeding? NHTSA also has through the federal highway data, they actually have crash data that looks similar. So you can start to compare one crash data set to another to understand if there was a crash, then what are some of the other implications? So that is your tip for today. You researchers out there that want to use the SGO, use it as a crash data set because you can get answers like this. So this graph that you see on the left, it is basically showing you at a high level, if you are speeding, five miles or more over the speed limit, who's getting into more crashes? People with ADAS or people not with ADAS? So, I mean, you know, in the Sesame Street world, I don't need to give you statistical significance for these two graphs. One's around 14%, one's around 44%. And by the way, I could see it everywhere, you know, Raise your hand in the room if you have a Tesla and or Super Cruise and or Blue Cruise. If anybody, no, I don't believe that. All right, nobody's admitting it because I don't want to be uh, the wrath of my uh, subject of my wrath. Because I do this, they're setting it at nine miles over the speed limit. They're setting autopilot, Blue Cruise, Super Cruise to go nine miles over the speed limit. And and then, in a lot of cases, and then they're checking out. They're going hands free. And hands-free, by the way, always means minds free always. Sometimes feet-free. And, uh, and then something bad happens, and they have to get it. And then we're back into that same loop that I showed you before, right? So, you know, it's a problem. It's a problem because in the National Roadway Safety Strategy, speed's a killer. We know speeding is bad, right? So I'm going to be very controversial today and say, uh, and I'll come to that, like, I don't think if you're in any kind of autonomy mode of driving, I don't think you should be legally allowed to speed. I don't think you should be allowed to set a speed limit above that's above the legal speed limit because we know that you're going to take your attention off the wheel. The other graph is just showing you um, property damage, injuries, fatalities. Fatalities way up, way up. That's concerning. You know, you we need to be more clear with people. You know, you say, oh, well, we've got a torque monitor on the steering wheel or we've got cameras watching you. Yeah, yeah. And you're also at a likely or higher risk um, because you're speeding in these cars. 
And you cannot control what you think you can in the time frames. You can't. It's, in some cases, it's just not physically human, humanly possible. Okay. So now what are we going to do about this? Oh, I'm sorry. I left the ugly off. Oh, oh, my favorite thing to talk about. Ugly, ugly safety cultures. So ugly. Like, I, I am shocked and appalled. Nobody in this room, by the way. I don't see any companies in this room that fall on my ugly list. Uh, I think that the traditional automotive manufacturers have lived in a world that they understand safety culture. I'm not saying they're all doing the perfect job, but I think that the history of having a, a more traditional car company means that you've got a very good safety office. At least you have the right personnel analyzing statistics. You know, some companies have gotten in trouble for this, but for the most part, they at least know what it is, right? What a safety culture is. Oh my God, I, I'm shocked. As a, as a person who's an aviator, uh, kind of what I saw, safety cultures. We need to do a better job at making sure that companies have some kind of safety culture, that things like hazard uh, analyses are being done, like uh, that people aren't just guessing at, you know, because maybe they're a Silicon Valley, although this problem is not exclusive to Silicon Valley, um, that they're just using their software development, agile processes and sprints. I heard somebody say that earlier today, they're sprinting. Oh yeah, sprinting and safety, never a good thing, right? And, and I wanna show you this deposition, which is a highlight of this. And now all the Tesla fanboys on the internet are really gonna get mad at me. Uh, I would appreciate it if somebody would walk with me to the airport later today. Uh, okay, uh, it's a deposition of the head of autopilot, I think it was about a year ago. This just went viral on the internet, um, I think a week or two ago. He's the head of autopilot. And this is his deposition for, um, I think the Walter Huang trial. And he said, do you know of any document that sets forth an operational design domain for auto steer? And he says, I do not. I know that I don't, Try not to be controversial, but I'm just telling you that's unacceptable. No person in the automotive industry who is in a position of leadership should not know what an ODD is and where the documents are that set forth how a car should or should not be behaving with an ODD. This is an example of bad safety culture because it communicates to me that we're not taking this seriously enough. Okay, so I already told you we need to rethink hands free. Look, I'm not saying that you can never take your hands off the wheel and grab something. We all do it. What I'm saying is we need to be clear with people. I don't think we should be advertising it. And I know that there are a lot of automotive manufacturers who are listening in right now who are mad about that because you've staked a lot. That patty cake commercial, I, I forget who did it, that thing drives me bananas. That's like my third rail. Like, yes, you can sometimes get away with that. But if something goes wrong, even in the ODD that the system is supposedly performing, able to perform in, things can go wrong. And I have seen too many crashes where humans were too relaxed, feet, hands, brain, somewhere else, and they just couldn't get to the controls effectively enough in the right moderation at the right time. So this isn't really a big change that I'm saying other than I do put the onus back on the automotive manufacturers to say, look, maybe you shouldn't advertise it. You know, I think for example, GM has great driver monitoring. I, they actually let me drive super, clue, super cruise before it actually went on the market. I think it's great. It's a great system, but I don't think you should encourage people ever to be hands-free because they associate that with mind-free and feet free in some cases. I also think that, again, Missy Cummings opinion, AV should only operate legally in the ODDs in which they've been formally self-certified to operate. If you're only been certified, if you're self-certifying to say, and you put it in your owner's manual that you say you should never use this automated driving system uh, in anywhere else but the highway, then that is an easy one line of code that can make that happen. You should not let people use it in ODDs where it is not formally self-certified. And legally, 
I think that we should put speed limiters on. And by the way, now everybody else on the planet is mad at me because nobody wants their speed limited. Like, but if you're going to turn over control to the car, I think you should. I think you should not be allowed to speed. I'm trying to save your life up here. I am maybe putting my own life at risk to try to tell you, you've got to think about what we're doing. And you've got to understand that the human is a critical component in this system. And they're not as, they're not as heroic as you think that they might be. I also don't think beta software testing should ever be allowed in operational safety critical systems. Your drivers are not your test drivers, period. We pay a lot of test drivers a lot of money. They have a lot of experience. They know what they're doing. Having your subjects, I mean, your um, uh, your drivers be your test. This, I mean, this isn't your iPhone. And I and I am just askance that anyone thinks that this is okay, that you're having people who are not qualified basically giving feedback. I mean, there's even, you know, in Tesla's, there, there, there's a way for people to give feedback. I appreciate that. And, you know, the other thing is it's, uh, I don't know how researchers do it without YouTube because we could be here all day and I could show you YouTube videos of problems and near accidents. And, you know, and, you know, honestly, for the most part, people are doing pretty good, but, you know, it is leading to accidents. I also think that state DOTs, need to develop some licensing requirements. Now, this, we're going a little bit askew towards remote operations, both of passenger cars, but more importantly, trucks. AV trucks are in theory coming. Okay. All the same problems that I talked to you today about cars apply to trucks as well. The mass is obviously much higher, so much higher risk. I think that state DOTs should be having remote operators go through some kind of licensing process. That's a whole nother discussion. Maybe we should do a workshop on that later. What should that look like? Uh, because there's a lot of important questions. What is the latency of these systems? What is the legal liability? Is your truck being remotely either assisted or teleoperated by somebody in the Ukraine, for example? And what would that do for any kind of accountability, li legal liability, in addition to um, latency issues. So I think that there's a lot to be said, you know. Oh, oh, by the way, and you should have licensed drivers, like commercially licensed drivers who are remotely assisting them, even if they're not driving, because they need that corporate knowledge of what is going on in the system. And it's unbelievable, as a college professor, I see this every day, how few people have their licenses now. So I have seen self-driving car companies with people coding the cars with no driver's license. Probably not a good idea. And last but not least on this slide anyway, um, what about the recall process? There are a lot of people who complain to NHTSA about NHTSA that it's not fair that when they have an over the air software update that that's not the same as a regular recall. I see both sides of the argument. NHTSA needs to have a recall process. And, you know, it's a very well-established recall process that's worked for a long time. The industry doesn't like the recall process. And so there's a couple things going on here. First of all, I do agree that software is a new deal. The recall process, as we know it now, was made for hardware systems. Tires that fail, tire, rod, tire rods that fail, right? Okay, so we need to understand that, okay, it was designed for more classic hardware, but now we need to go to software. So I know NHTSA is thinking about it because I was in some of those meetings. So I know they're trying to get their arms around it, but I challenge anyone in this room to, tell, to come up with a, a plan to how to do this effectively and to ensure accountability without actually completely changing the entire regulatory structure. So I know that I agree that there should be a different kind of recall for over the air updates, but I also think people need to be patient and recognize that, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. And so we need to try to figure out together, don't just point the finger at NHTSA and say, it's your problem. I, I encourage everyone, especially in this room, come on, let's work together. Let's try to get together with some thinking, some group thinking about what would a good way to do that be? And how would we ensure, for example, 
you know, that if a software update does go in and it touches a safety critical system, how are we going to guarantee that that's not going to cause new problems, right? So I don't have an answer to that right now. That's kind of one of the reasons I'm here is I want us to think about this as a group of thought leaders in this room. This is a good kind of problem for us to solve. Uh, and last but not least, as a mom of a teenager, I have to tell you, like, I see, especially the Silicon Valley companies, their relationship with NHTSA is like very similar that I have with my teenager. They complain about everything. They're mad. They think you're doing things to them because it's so unfair. And I, I think that there's for, for the new entrance into the automotive world, I think that they see NHTSA as maybe the evil overlord. Whereas more traditional companies are like, ah, you know, it's people we know and we talk to them and we work with them. And we don't see if we're having a problem, we actually call NHTSA in advance before it comes out in the New York Times, for example, uh, so that they have a, an idea of, so we know what's coming and so we can work with NHTSA. So I really cannot communicate that strongly enough. Um, NHTSA is, is like that parent they want you to succeed, but they have to put some guardrails out there to make sure that you're not doing anything so crazy that either you're going to kill yourself or kill someone else, right? And so I think having a more collaborative arrangement, understanding, yes, that they are a regulatory agency, but in the end, they're not a bad guy. All right, last slide, and then we'll go to questions. So you're saying, you said that you don't complain about anything. What are you doing to fix these problems? Well, okay, so first of all, I did spend a little over a year with NHTSA. Uh, I tell you, the person that was hardest on was the NHTSA lawyer. I can promise you that. And, uh, and so now that I'm outside of that, I am trying to do some research as a researcher. That's what I do. One of the things that we're looking at is the quality of computer vision labeling that's happening to images and how human errors and or auto automated errors in labeling propagate through a convolutional neural net and affect the outcomes to the point where it could land in that Bay Bridge tunnel incident. So this picture that I'm showing you up here, you all see a motorcycle rally. It's four, four motorcyclists, they're parked off to the side of the road. Awesome. But we took that image and ran it through a CNN, uh, uh, I'm sorry, what, um, uh, well, CNN using the most common um, Im image and the common algorithm underneath that would be found in a driverless car. And it did not see any of the motorcycles. What it saw was there is a car way back here between these trees. And it labeled the car and completely did not see four motorcycles that are clearly the most salient problem. This is recent. That Toyota eight-year-old picture I showed you, eight years old, brand new. I've got a PhD student still working this problem. We're going to be publishing this soon. This is a huge problem, right? And we don't know how much of this is being caused by human labeling. There are, in fact, if you didn't see the news today, um, I think I think it was Tesla, the people who are doing Tesla image labeling are about to go on strike or unionize or something uh, because they want better um, working conditions. I'm telling you right now, I have seen labeling warehouses. It's miserable. People sit there and they just label all day long and they, they try to gamify it and incentivize it. And guess what? The labels at the end of an eight hour shift are not nearly as good as they were at the beginning of that shift. So I do think that we need to spend a lot more time trying to figure out how we're designing AI, how does that affect the performance of AI? I think we also need to determine paths for certification. Every single person in this room that's in this industry knows that because I heard you talking about it right before we started, right? So something that all of you are thinking about. And I recently left Duke to join George Mason because George Mason gave me a fantastic opportunity to start an entirely new degree program in what we're calling Artificial Intelligence Design and Evaluation, AID. The program is going to teach you AI. It's going to teach you risk. It's going to teach you systems engineering, including certification. Are we going to have all the answers? No, but we're going to have a cohort of people who know what it takes to think about autonomy, uncertainty, risk, testing. We have two tracks, one in engineering, one in public policy. That is because engineers need to work right along with public policy 
and vice versa. Public policy needs to work with engineering. If I hear one more person in the government put the words digital twin, artificial intelligence, and blockchain in the same sentence, I'm going to go crazy. I'll help the Tesla guys and I'll kill myself. Uh, because, like, I, I can't take it. Like, I mean, don't do that to you. Know, I'm just everybody listening. That is an intelligence test that means you don't know what you're talking about, right? And so what I'm trying to do is create a workforce that doesn't do that, that even if you're not an expert in the field, you don't need to be a neural net, Jan LeCun genius to be able to understand what is happening in these systems and how to regulate and test and identify systems that are or are not gonna work with your system. All right, with that, I know there's so many questions. Um, who can tell me? I meant to bring um, something to give us a prize. Who can tell me what book this is from? The Sneetches. Don't be a Sneetch. Don't, don't get the, that's right, the Sneetches. And you're young, so I'm really impressed that you know that. Or so. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. He's got the kid handicapped. That would have been more impressed if you had been a single, no dad. Kid. Okay. All right. So, um, Henry. Um, uh, should I take questions here in this room first? Do you want to do that first? Yeah, we can take questions yeah. from here. Sure. I, have a, yeah. I have at least a 20 questions online, but oh. I'll, I'll, I'll give the priority to uh, the, the people. Because this side of work that we always talk about. Okay. Thank you, Missy. That was great. Um, uh, quick question. About three or four years ago, this started a series, or supposed to be a series of conferences with our operation. I think they didn't first one. I don't remember there ever being a second or third or fourth. But one critical question, or at least it seemed like maybe it wasn't even a question anymore at the end of the conference, is is there actually an acceptable latency at all for tele operations? As some uh, participants emphasize, it can only take a half a second for a kid to step off a curve. So, scene goes back to you said Ukraine or Belarus or whatever. No kid in the scene moves the car forward. By the time that message gets back, even at the speed of light, it gets hit by the car. I, I, I don't know that there's an acceptable use of teleoperation in that case. Other than in some fairly unique environments where it's like not possible for there's fencing, barbed wire, whatever, no one can appear out of out of nowhere, you know, NASCAR tracks. I don't know. But uh, just like your input on that, it, you know, you mentioned the operation several times after participating in that first NIST event, it's hard for us to see. How it really helps here, except in very extreme, like you said, car breaks down in the middle of the road. How the heck do we get it off? It's going to be an emergency operator standing right next to the car that has a code that allows remote up. It's not someone back in Ukraine. I don't see how that could possibly work, even at the speed of light. It's not 5G, it's not 11G. Mm -hmm. I think that's the uh, yes. Uh, yes. So the question is, is, is latency, is it even possible to achieve good enough latencies for remote teleoperation of self-driving cars? So that's, as the people at NHTSA will tell you, that's kind of my third rail. Um, uh, I agree with you mostly. I would say mostly to say, I do think that there are some cases for very slow speed operations. So you can imagine, you know, for crews, I think it would have been a big help for them if, they could have at least had somebody like five miles per hour or less, you know, back the car up and slowly back the car out of that situation. And, you know, with lots of speakers and, you know, hey, get, you know, they've got also, yeah, right, right. So I think, I think that there are some uses for teleop. Um, I have been very concerned and, and the people at NHTSA will tell you, I just ran around like chicken little, teleop, teleop bad, teleop bad, got to pay attention to this. Um, so I agree with you. The problem is, where's my SAE person who I warned uh, that he was going to hate me after? See, even the standards guys are going to hate me after this talk. 
I do find that SAE, UL 4600, all of them are missing. I know that you guys are working on it. There's working groups talking about it, but I think we need to stop talking about it and get a standard out there that says unequivocally, this must be. Now, me, Missy Cummings, I'd put that at like 10 milliseconds, but I'm conservative. IEEE has said 30 milliseconds is too much, right? So somewhere between, is there an answer between 10, the Missy Cummings conservative 10 milliseconds and 30 milliseconds? Probably, but this is where I think, and I'm trying to do research right now. It's one of the things I'm working on at Mason. Like, by the way, guys, gals, I have no time. I'm really busy because I'm trying to do all this research. Plus come hang out with you guys. Um, but yes, I, I do think that we need more specific research on what effective latencies are, because I'm very concerned that not only are a lot of companies spending a lot of money that is going to be wasted, but somebody's going to get killed. So, uh, having worked for GM for 39 years before I get in the point of retirement, so I'm just happy to be here. Uh, <laughs> I've often thought that NHPSA was hands off Tesla and the M ones. And, you know, as you point out, that uh, they know where these cars are pretty closely. And so why does it NHTSA tell Tesla, disable the system when you get off interstates? I mean, very simple. And if it had been any other OEM in this country that had a long history, it would have been all over long. I think they're scared of Tesla. Well, uh, you know, I can't speak for how everyone feels exactly, but I can say that it is tricky um, I used to be that person that ran around and said, shut autopilot down, shut it down. And then once yeah. off the interstate, right. Which is, I just told you, you know, that in general, I feel the same way that we should, that if there's a rule to be made, you know, the rule would be cars can only operate in these systems and the ODDs of which they were certified legally. You would, they could just take that bullet and make that a rule. Like that's how I feel. But let me caveat that and say, it is harder than it sounds because, especially if you're thinking about, well, why aren't they doing more in the defects process? Well, first of all, if there's if you identify a problem and then the company can come back and tell you, we have fixed that with an over there update that we've pushed to everyone. So now we start to see kind of the flaw in our defects um, situation because Okay, if a company can does everything they need to do to demonstrate that they've had a fix and that they've pushed it out to their drivers, you know, it's a complicated situation. And so I, I hear you, and you know, I generally agree with you, but I think we also have to remember that regulatory agencies have to follow sets of rules and procedures, and and you can like it or not, but that is the system that we are in. It has generally worked up to this point. And I know that NHTSA is going on a big hiring. They're trying to hire a lot more people to start looking more in depth at these issues. So, you know, be, be a little patient. There are people thinking about it and there are really good people inside of NHTSA who want to see the right thing done. Other questions? Hi, my name is Scott Burroughs. I'm a professor at Canton. Here, so maybe a quick remark first. I think in your previous picture, that was fine for the fact was one of them was hidden by the two people in the back. <laughs> that, a very good point. Okay, but uh, that's not the main question. Uh, the question is this, are we solving the right problem here? And let me try to elaborate a little bit. So about 100 years ago here in this state, you know, we started to make a lot of automobiles, okay? And I'm pretty sure that when they hit the roads, which didn't look like these days, there were a lot of accidents and probably there's a lot of data about it. And rather than asking all these automobiles to be driving all these crazy scenarios, we started to make new rules. They built new roads, right? So it wasn't like, okay, you have to drive in any circumstances in anywhere. But we said, okay, you can drive on roads, you know, you can drive fast. And then we also asked, you know, people not to uh, jaywalk. Jaywalking was actually invented by the auto industry to shame people to, to not to cross the road. So in this sense, is there any role of, you know, creating new rules, new infrastructure for autom uh, automated vehicles rather than we try to make them run on the 20th century infrastructure? Oh boy, that's a really loaded question. Um, so now I'm about to make NC State 
hit, hate me. So I'm telling you, I'm gonna get everybody. Even though I really like NC State and have a lot of collaborators there, um, I'm not sure if you saw the article this week where they've come up, they're proposing a new traffic light, a white light just for AVs. And you're gonna follow the AV if you get the white. I'd like, I have to tell you guys, gals, I was like, oh. Oh, if we think we're having mode confusion with whether your autopilot is on, you just wait to see whether people can see that white light. I mean, it would just be sheer chaos. You know, I don't state farms in the room, you know, your claims are going to go way up if, if people do that. Right. So, you know, I, I like, I, I appreciate that people are trying to think out of the box, but I think fundamentally you can say, yes, we should change the infrastructure in all these ways. But the reality is state DOTs don't have that kind of money. And what a cost to paint the lines on the roads just to keep them nice, crisp, and white. You know, I mean, that in and of itself is a basic infrastructure problem that we all agree would be better, not just for AVs, but also human drivers if we all had better lines painted on the road. And, uh, you know, I lived in Boston for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> that's not happening. So, uh, you know, and rural America, you know, so, you know, I think that we have to recognize that there's only so far that we can go for infrastructure. I think that this is great topics for university transportation centers, research centers, for example. Uh, but I think that we need to be also reasonable about somebody's going to have to pay for it. And in the end, that's probably going to determine what gets picked up. Yeah, uh, uh, Brian has been a good engineer. Uh, given the uh, possibility of engineering or regulating uh, operators particularly around human behavior, uh, are there any thoughts? And, and your last uh, point that may be addressing it of uh, instituting special licensing uh, for operators in the common area. Yeah, so I, you know, I think that it's there's a big debate going on right now. Um, state of Washington is right now arguing over you know what should happen with autonomous vehicles and should there be licensing you know who has the authority to license the, the driver and it, it, this is actually interesting because it is a state versus federal argument as well like does NHTSA uh, rule the technology that's the driver because it's the tech on the car or does the state be can they impose a license on a quote-unquote driver of a car that has not been tested in a court. I suspect it might be. Uh, you know, so I think that there is that question about who's licensing the quote unquote autonomous driver, not solved. There's also, should we license people who are in remote operations? And we already talked about teleop for sure. If we are gonna do teleop, I, I, I'm so confident. I'm such an arrogant person. I am confident that every remote teleop driving test would fail just I, because I've never seen it at speed, like anything more than five, 10 miles an hour. Uh, but I think we also need that license for remote assistance. So there's another thing like, you know, an Einride has this, there's a you know, they're gonna have people assisting. Okay, I think that's great. But I think those people should also be licensed because they need to know all the rules of the road for the particular domain that they're working in. Yeah, I'm going to take the liberty of uh, asking questions from online. I have 21 questions online, so I gave a lot of priority to the, uh, to the audience here. Um, in, but we are three minutes over um, the time. But let me just start with the first question. Um, the argument is the, uh, 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 the question is that, uh, the speed is, the argument is speed is not a killer. Um, um, back where I was off. And the, I mean, the, this question refers to German Autobahn has a ratio of 3.9 ads per um, as, as, uh, 100,000 people. Well, American ratio is 12.4 for uh, 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 100,000. And they also get the web, web page and print show uh, that. So, how do you? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. Look, there are cultural differences, there just are. And uh, we are one of the worst nations in the world. This is objective in terms of achieving vision zero, you know, zero deaths on the roadways. You know, I, I, 
at the risk of making every other, if I haven't already made somebody mad to hate me, I can say everybody else will hate me. Look, we just have a driving culture problem. And it kind of, it goes to the infrastructure. You know, you always see like, I almost got physically ran over the other day as a pedestrian by a gigantic truck. They didn't see me in front of the truck. I'm five foot four. Like you can't, that, I'm an adult. So, you know, I think that we have some issues um, deeply psychological, maybe I've just turned to Twitter, uh, you know, um, about our love of cars and who should have to say about us. And I think it's all of these cultural issues that play into that. So yes, do I think that other countries can operate by a different set of rules? Yes, except I would say that even the Europeans, where they have very safe, much safer numbers than we do, they have type certification for their autonomous vehicles. You have to be approved before you put your car on the road. So uh, type certification is another one, Matt. You raise that to pretty much anybody in the automotive industry. And it, again, I might have to be walked, you know, escorted out the room uh, because it'll make some people so mad to bring up type certification. But you cannot deny that in countries with type certification, they have a lot fewer problems. Maybe I'll ask the last question, which will be the best controversy. <laughs> so uh, the question is, you presented a robust argument outlining the issues with the power of cars and with all outcomes in pressing the um, aerospace approach to exceed the uh, um, reward of fire. Um, there's growing momentum with autonom um, automated, uh, autonomous urban air vehicles. What are your thoughts on <laughs> Wow, that is a great question to end on because I should just tell you to clear your schedules and we'll just stay here for the rest of the afternoon to talk about um, autonomous, um, the EV tall aircraft. Uh, I do, I've sat on many boards and helped out on many projects, written several papers on this topic. So I, I personally, you know, love the idea of the Jetsons, which is kind of the inspiration behind this. Uh, so I, as a research topic and we're spending NASA development money, like I'm hundred percent in support of all of that, but I am also here to tell you, I just cannot imagine what that human interaction was going to look like in that cockpit, right? Who's pressing what button, who's going to do something bad, you know, like I, I do think that fundamentally much like we see this in cars, the technology developers Nobody that I've talked about today, I know I've taken Cruz and Tesla to task, but even those companies really want the best product out on the market. Nobody wants to make a bad product. What happens is humans come in when they can, and they, especially Americans, we've already like, you know, there's, there's some, they introduce some problems that you may not have thought you were going to have or that you were going to be able to control. And, you know, of course, I'm being self-serving when I say this, but there is a reason why I do humans and autonomy research. I saw in the 36 months that I flew um, F-18s, I saw 36 people die. And it was all because of bad human automation interaction. And now as a, as a professor and I'm in the surface transportation, I'm seeing a repeat of that. I couldn't control what happened in aviation, I can control now, hopefully. And then I'm hoping that the lessons that NHTSA and the rest of the government and uh, Department of Transportation, I hope that they learn from everything that's happening so that we can set up a framework so that we don't have the same problem in air taxis. But if we don't do something, we will. Thank you so much. That's all I have. Thank you. There you go. Um, so that's, so I, again, I want to thank uh, Professor Missy Cummings for taking time out of her busy schedule to join us today. Um, I want to say if you miss any part of the um, today's presentation, it will be available um, on our YouTube channel on Monday. Um, and I also have a few announcements before I close the seminar. Um, and our first research review uh, in 2023 is scheduled on Wednesday. This will be uh, Professor Dong Feng Shun from uh, Purdue University. 
uh, will highlight her his project uh, focusing on op optimi optimizing red sharing with advanced air mobility. Um, you can scan the QR code um, and um, on the screen to uh, uh, register. Also, I also uh, want to share with you that um, uh, as part of the 2023 CCAT Global Symposium, um, I think I have that. Yeah, okay. Um, so it will be on April 5th and 4th, and uh, there will be a panel on um, 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 on uh, public trans public transport automation, and this will be led uh, by uh, Megan Grilla uh, from uh, Via uh, Transportation. And again, if you uh, want to attend the um, uh, the symposium, please sign up for our mailing list or register online. And uh, uh, still have a, we still have an early bird uh, um, registration rate, um, and uh, you can also. Um, um, uh, register through the chat box if you register online if you are online from the uh, from the zoom and uh, that's all I have thank you everyone for joining us today we uh, I hope that you have a great uh, rest of the day thank you thank you